starts right now. Viva Fiesta! Absolutely, Fiesta just a couple of days away. The party with a purpose now facing some inflation. What it's going to cost when it comes to some of Fiesta's most famous foods and events. It's coming up, but first. Is smoke and flames have been a reoccurring site on the city's east side over the last couple of days. This time, dozens of fire crews called out to the historic Friedrich building, which is expected to become a site for new housing soon. Now, firefighters say that when they got there this evening, it turned out to be a small fire. They put the flames out, but this is the latest in a string of fires that arson investigators are looking into. The San Antonio Fire Department says it's possible that someone who's homeless may have started that fire, but a fire captain on scene told us that that they just couldn't rule out other possibilities just yet. This morning, two homes on the east side caught fire. This was on Hackberry near Omaha Street. Firefighters say that both of those homes were under construction, so nobody was home at the time. Now, because of the recent number or the number of recent fires on the east side, the fire department is asking people in those particular areas to be on the lookout for anything that they see as suspicious. Now from house fires to wildfires, our coverage continues on the Doss Goat Fire. Tonight, that fire remains 95% contained. It sparked Friday after a vehicle caught fire off of County Road 271. Since that point, nearly 1,100 acres have burned. Three homes have been completely destroyed. Others were narrowly saved. One of the hardest hit areas is the High Mountain Ranch subdivision, and that's where we find the night team's Lee Waldman. Lee, you took a tour of that area today as people were finally allowed back in. Describe what you saw. Well, seeing what's left after this fire, it's hard to imagine how this neighborhood looked beforehand. Uh, it almost takes your breath away, taking in everything that was burned, especially seeing just how close this fire got to many of those homes. It's something that ESD one fire chief Clint Cook tells me is a testament to the work of the ground crews. The drive into the High Mountain Ranch subdivision comes with a sudden change. Greenery morphing into gray ash, acre after acre reduced to a wasteland. Really, really hot areas, you see far more rock because it consumed all of the mulch and ground cover. The Doss Goat fire burning so intensely, only rock remains. Some houses, even brush, you see covered in pink. That's from retardant drops from the sky, an effort to help ground crews save homes. This was a very, very difficult spot for them. Uh, they were committed to making sure this house was saved. They had, a, they had kind of a refuge area over there and uh, allowed them to make a decision that they wanted to focus on the house. Crews quite literally putting themselves between the fire and the home. The attached deck burned, but they were able to keep it from spreading to the main structure. Everyone was here for the same mission. They came from all over the state. Nobody cared who was in this house. They wanted to make sure that this house was saved and the community you know, had a house to come back to. Their work allowed John Galvin to come back to his home. His shed and barn are lost, but fire crews saved his house and took care of his animals. Feed my chickens and water my chickens through that whole process and feed the cats. And because I only had six kittens when I left, when I come back, I had three more. Galvin's young children are still trying to grasp what happened, why their toys are gone. Galvin, on the other hand, finding things to be thankful for. I'm glad the house is up. I'm glad that we got the power back on, the AC work, got the water pump going, got the pressure on good. While the present danger seems to be blowing off with the ash, Cook says it's not time to relax. We still have a significant risk all across our region with the continued drought and the fire danger. And the state resources are, the state provides a, a great number of resources, but there's only so many of them right now. Now, Cook talked about that continued risk, and it's something that we saw firsthand today. A tree in the middle of that burned area ignited. It was something that hadn't burned before, but he tells us that they were able to get it under control very quickly before it was able to spread to anything else. He says that just speaks to how incredibly dry things out here are out here. Uh, the, the fire conditions that keep persisting, he's asking people to stay fire aware and stay vigilant. Live in Medina County, Lee Waldman. KSAT 12 News. Great job by those fire crews out there and you as well, Lee. Thank you. Our coverage of the wildfires continues online at KSAT.com. To scan this QR code with your phone, it'll take you directly to an article with links to report any damage. We also have listed the sites to visit on your screen. They are the Medina County, Texas.org. You can also visit damage.tdem.texas.gov. 
We have all this information on our website at KSAT.com. And tomorrow's actually going to be worse than what we had today when it comes to fire weather. Red flag warning in effect from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. tomorrow, and that's because we'll have gusty conditions and very dry air in place. I mean, today wasn't good by any means, but it's going to be much worse tomorrow. Let's first just talk about winds. Still pretty gusty out there. Winds are coming out of the southeast. Gusty now to 30 miles per hour and they'll stay elevated through the night. There's going to be a brief period tomorrow morning right when a cold front hits where the winds drop off a little bit. That's around 5 6 a.m. And then very quickly thereafter they crank back up and I think we'll be facing wind gusts to about 45 miles per hour at times tomorrow that can help spread fires rapidly. We'll talk about the dry air, how dry it's going to get, how long it's going to stick around. And of course, look at temperatures Fiesta Fiesta just around the corner. We'll see you in a bit. Adam, thank you. Tonight we're learning more about the bicyclist who was killed in a crash and the person who's also blamed for that accident. Authorities say that Emilian Ramirez was killed one week ago while he was riding his bike near Bassey Road and McCullough. He was 18 years old. Family and friends held a vigil for him after that crash and they were understandably way too upset to speak with the media. But they did leave a ghost bike to honor his memory and also remind drivers to stay vigilant. Now, police say that Bella de Garza was intoxicated when she was behind the wheel of the vehicle that crashed into Ramirez. They also say that she was traveling with a baby in her car. Investigators say that she was speeding before she lost control and hit Ramirez, then slammed into a tree. Right now, Garza is charged with intoxication, manslaughter and child endangerment. By the way, the child that was in the vehicle with her was taken to the hospital after that crash. Betrayed and victimized all over again. Family members say that's how they feel after a Bear County deputy killed their loved one and then avoided a jury trial. We told you the district attorney dropped the case against Bear County deputy Brandon Moran just days after a grand jury returned an indictment against him. Moran was accused in the death of Jesus Garcia. Garcia's daughter released a statement saying in part, quote, whether or not Deputy Moran is guilty was a decision for a jury to make. The district attorney's message seems clear to us. The police in Bear County know they can shoot someone without being held to answer in a court of law. End quote. The police in Bear County know and that goes on without having to answer to a court of law. Again, what they said in that statement. Garcia's family plans to move forward with the wrongful death lawsuit, saying Garcia was holding a screwdriver to his own neck and threatening to harm himself when Moran shot and killed him. A video from the scene appears to show Garcia surrender before he was shot. District Attorney Joe Gonzalez defended his decision to have the charge dismissed against Deputy Moran. Gonzalez said Garcia had a potentially lethal weapon and pinned his wife to the ground. The DA says state law allows police to use lethal force to stop an aggravated kidnapping and argued it would be difficult to disprove that the deputy defended the woman's life. Deputy Moran has since been returned back to the Bear County force. Now switching gears now, let's talk boosters. Health officials just approved another one. This would be the fourth shot and would only be for people older than 50. So we know the FDA and the CDC signed off on it, but they didn't formally recommend it. So that's the difference here. Instead, they want people who are eligible to make their own decisions regarding this booster. It's important to have a conversation with your provider about your personal risk, your past medical history to understand the benefit of an additional dose. Now, next week, the FDA is going to consider a second booster shot for all Americans and a potential variant specific booster. Experts have said that most vaccinated and boosted people are still protected. The average number of COVID cases in the U.S. is at its lowest point since last August. So now let's get more specific with those numbers, because right here at home, we're seeing fewer COVID patients in the hospital. Tonight, there are 98. 30 of them are in the intensive care unit, 14 are on ventilators. 151 new cases were confirmed along with one new death. And tonight, Metro Health is describing our risk level as low. Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia now saying it will drastically reduce combat operations around the capital of Kyiv and another northern city. But it's not exactly a ceasefire. U.S. officials believe Russian forces are pulling back in some areas of the north to focus on gains in the south and the east. But Secretary of State Anthony Blinken cautions this could be a deception. There is what Russia says and there's what Russia does. We're focused on the latter. 
This comes after peace talks began in Turkey today. Ukraine's president urged people to stay vigilant and warned Russia still has significant potential to continue its attacks. Coming up tonight, a recall on baby formula leading to more questions tonight. Why Congress is now grilling the FDA for answers. And Fiesta can't escape the rise in prices. So what does that mean for your chicken on a stick or other fan favorites at Fiesta? We're going to take a look at how organizers are dealing with inflation and how it's going to impact the pocketbook. It's next on the Night Beat. And now for today's headlines, Bernie police releasing an update on that crash that killed a four year old on I-10 yesterday. The family involved in that one car rollover is from Fo Foley, Alabama. Now, police say that a woman was driving a black SUV, lost control, rolled over. Three children were thrown from that car and may not have been properly restrained. A case stretching back nearly six years finally coming to a close. Maurice Medina was charged in the shooting death of a man that tried to break up a fight on Cecilia Street back in 2016. Now, after delays before and obviously during the pandemic, Maurice came back into the courtroom, this time for a plea deal. He pleaded no contest, waived his right to a trial. A judge sentenced Medina to 20 years, but his six years in jail already are being counted as time served, and he could get parole in four years. A baby formula recall leading to questions. Could the FDA have acted sooner? Records show that the FDA knew about sanitation problems at the Abbott Manufacturing Plant in Michigan last September. It was only after a baby died that the company issued last month's recall of some Similac and other brands. And now Congress is questioning the agency's ability to regulate the inf infant formula marketplace. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. It is nearly that time again. There will be lines to grab that chicken on a stick, oysters, bongo kebabs, plenty of drinks. But some of your Fiesta favorites, they're going to cost you a little more. The night team's Patty Santos looks at how inflation could impact your celebration. The entry fee for night in old San Antonio is staying the same, but some of your favorite foods are going up. Pot stickers, they were very difficult to find, but we found some and they went up a dollar. Here's what else is going up by a dollar. Crispy shrimp wraps, corn on the cob, corn in a cup, sopa pillas, lemonade and tea. Price for chicken on the stick stayed the same at $8. We're just trying to hold the price so everybody can afford to come down and have a good time. Organizers at the King Williams Fair facing rising costs too. They say contractors have doubled their prices. Trash cleanup has tripled. To offset inflation costs, the fee for the King Williams Fair will increase from $15 to $20 this year. Your entry fee at Oyster Bake will stay the same this year, but expect all the foods and drinks to go up an extra dollar. Organizers say the fixed costs have gone up over 20% this year. Enjoying a taste of the north side is going to cost you more too. General admission increased by $30 for a total of $125 with advanced purchase or $150 at the door. Please know that the money is going towards a good cause. Steve Rosenauer with the Fiesta Commission says their 100 plus organizations are doing the best they can to put on great events on a budget following a pandemic all while still making money to help their nonprofits. It's the lifeblood of their organization in order for them to support their mission. Organizations are counting on the crowds to show up in Fiesta. We're just hoping we're going to have a lot more sales, a lot more customers down here buying a lot more because I think everybody is ready to party. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Ready yeah. to party. You can head to KSAT.com to find a list of the free Fiesta events you can enjoy. Also, consider using Rideshare to avoid parking fees near the event. A 2017 economic impact study, by the way, showed the annual Fiesta events bring in $340 million to San Antonio. Wow. And one of the many things I'm excited about, I mean, we're, it's back after the pandemic, all of this. This is Stephanie's first Fiesta. Yes, I know. I was watching She's all that stuff. She's never experienced I'm it. I'm excited about trying all that food and experiencing all that and meeting all of you out there. Super excited. <laughs> I know. Oh, oh we're going to have some it fun. It will be fun, yes. Oh, this is good. That just makes it even better this year for us. Oh, this is going to be great. <laughs>
have a few things going in my mind already that I've been pre planning out. You'll have to wait to see it. All right, pre dawn cold front hits us early tomorrow morning. A few showers with it, but mainly behind that cold front, it's going to be gusty and dry tomorrow. We talked about the red flag warning that takes effect at 10 a.m. Just another one of those days where something as simple as parking your car in tall grass from the warm undercarriage exhaust and catalytic converter could ignite a fire along with just discarding a cigarette out the window. So let's talk about rain. First of all, that cold front's going to bring us a few showers and we could use it, but unfortunately, I'm not really expecting much around here. Don't get your hopes high. There's, you see that defined line of storms with the severe thunderstorm watch boxes from roughly Sonora to San Angelo, Abilene, Wichita Falls, Oklahoma City. That's the cold front and a very thin line of thunderstorms and even a few embedded severe thunderstorms that's pushing eastward. As usual, we're going to be right on the tail end of the activity and just get clipped by some of it. Here's our future cast hill country by about 3 a.m. A few areas of light to moderate rainfall, a little bit of lightning and thunder, so could wake you up in the middle of the night tonight. And then by about 5 a.m. around San Antonio, yeah, look at this future cast. I mean, that's maybe what, five, 10 miles wide, maybe that rain band it's depicting across Bear County. Very brief. You have better odds of a quick downpour the farther north you are of San Antonio, up in Comal County and even Hayes County, particularly. And then look at 6 a.m. Here you have it still a little before sunrise and just a few light showers and very thin line, broken line of storms moving east of here. Then just sunny and dry the majority of the day. And unfortunately, rain chances don't really come back into the picture, at least nothing meaningful uh, it, at all in the foreseeable future. A 10 to 20 percent chance Sunday and Monday, and that's about it. So not a lot of moisture to add to our drought stricken ground or add to the aquifer. And we're actually going to take the moisture out of the air. We had some mugginess today, actually dew points right now in the 60s. But you see that dry air in West Texas that's headed our way. That's behind the cold front. We're going to get that dry West Texas air and some gusty winds with it. So dew points right now well into the 60s. You feel the humidity. Look how sharply they drop off once that front hits tomorrow. I mean, we're talking dew points in the 30s by tomorrow morning. Also, the winds going to pick up tomorrow. I mean, here's our for forecast through the night. You'll notice some gusty winds out of the south and during the day tomorrow, you're going to notice the same wind gusts probably up to about 40 miles per hour at times tomorrow, even 45 in some cases. Currently, low to mid 70s for most of us. Bernie exception at 68 tomorrow morning, right near 60 degrees. So Bernie 57 along with Bulverde, Floresville 64 and Castorville 59. Then by the afternoon, we're into the 80s, some lower 80s in the hill country, closer to 90 south of Highway 90 and a lot of sunshine with those wind gusts up to 45 miles per hour. So dry air, gusty winds, fires can and will spread rapidly. Fiesta Fiesta, comfortable, low humidity and not even sweating a whole lot out there. We'll be close to 80 degrees during the event. I'm paying attention. 85 on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Not Beautiful humid. Day. Yep. Not humid. Love it. Are you going to whip out the way Of course. There you go. <laughs> I mean, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> one of the many that you have in your Yeah, mind. exactly. I could do wardrobe changes, I yeah, guess. As a plethora. Probably not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Deshaun Watson. I mean, he may not play. Well, there's a chance, you know, the NFL could suspend him or fine him or both. And that warning was actually delivered today by the commissioner himself where he caused to Deshaun Watson's upcoming season with the Cleveland Browns. And the Spurs just moved up to the 10th play in position just like that <laughs> for now. We don't get a lot of really tough courses anymore, and this is one of them. There you go. Jordan Speed returns to San Antonio to defend his Valero Texas Open title in big board sports. But first, pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Deshaun Watson may not have to face any criminal charges, but the commissioner of the NFL made it very clear today that the now Cleveland Browns quarterback still may be facing disciplinary action from the league that could include fine suspension or both for his behavior. Speaking at a press conference at the team owners meeting in Florida, Commissioner Roger Goodell said that Watson, who was traded from the Texans to the Browns for six draft picks and received a new fully guaranteed contract, of 230 million dollars is not out of the woods yet pending the results of the nfl's own investigation the personal conduct policy is something that's very important to us uh, and so the personal conduct policy does not need a criminal violation to be a violation of the personal conduct policy so they recognize that that's something that we're going to pursue uh, we're going to make sure that we get to the bottom of the facts and make sure that how it applies to the personal conduct policy 
All right, the NFL team owners meeting in Florida this week have decided to make a rule change for overtime, but only for the playoffs. This comes after the Kansas City Chiefs beat the Buffalo Bills in the divisional playoff round last year with an opening possession touchdown. Now for the playoffs, only each team will be guaranteed a possession, regardless if the first team scores a touchdown in overtime. The field for the 100th anniversary of the Valero Texas Open has arrived in the Alamo City to begin play with the first round on Thursday at the J.W. Merritt TPC Resort course just north of town, including defending champion Jordan Spieth, who will try and become the first champion to defend his title since Zach Johnson did it in 2008 and 2009. But keep in mind, Spieth has done this before when the tournament was held at La Cantera. The former Texas Longhorn won the Valero Texas Open back-to-back -back tournaments in 2000 and 2001, the first since Honor Palmer pulled off three consecutive wins in 1960, 61, and 62 at Fort Sam Houston, and then Oak Hills Country Club. It's got tremendous history, and for a tournament to to be around that long on the PGA Tour, there's you know there's only a very small handful of events like that. So um, I'm happy to be here this year. It was never in question, and um, I look forward to trying to repeat. All right, play begins on Thursday. The first round runs through Sunday, and we begin our coverage live on Thursday. Here's a look at the pairings that have just come out here. We're starting with the top with uh, Jordan Spieth, also at 109. Henrik Stenson at 131. Elsewhere, we include on the pairings, it'll be at the number 10 tee this time, not the number one. Rory McIlroy is part of that group, along with Ricky Fowler and Jimmy Walker right here out of San Antonio. For the first time since March of 2007, our San Antonio Spurs have gone undefeated on a road trip of four games or more. As after the Spurs were able to beat the Golden State Warriors, Portland Trailblazers, New Orleans Saints, and last night, the Rockets in Houston to go 4-0. And more importantly, now on the 10th and final playing position after the Lakers lost tonight and the Spurs owning the season series in the Western Conference. That's a tiebreaker. And to make it more impressive, that was the year the Spurs won their fourth NBA title with a big three. Tony, Tim, Manu, that included big shot Rob. And the Spurs did it behind DeJounte Murray career high of 33 points last night. Still, this game would go down to the wire. Spurs leading by three. The Rockets had a chance to tie the game, send it into overtime. But Kenya Martin Jr.'s three-pointer went down around the rim and out somehow. And the Spurs kept their victory intact, 123-120. I thought we were great uh, for the last game of the 10-day road trip. We went in and out tonight. You know, we, we, got, we jumped on them, and then we lost our – Solid tight play, got a little sloppy, took some things for granted. They got back in the game, and uh, I'll tell you, uh, they bust their butts. They played a win. Uh, they did a great job. And I thought that, as I said, overall for having the last game of that road trip, being on the road that long, uh, we hung in there and we got it done, so I'm proud of the guys. The Spurs got a huge assist tonight from the Mavericks in Dallas where they throttled the Los Angeles Lakers 128-110, to dropping the purple and gold to 11th in the Western Conference standings, now tied with the Spurs for the overall record and the Spurs owning the tiebreaker. Luka Doncic led the way with 34 points, part of his 10th triple-double of the season. The Lakers are playing without LeBron James tonight, dealing with his chronic ankle issues, and Anthony Davis did not suit up, even though he did participate in his first practice on Monday, out since February the 16th after spraining his foot. And here's the next matchup for the Spurs. Very difficult team, Memphis. Grizzlies that'll be tomorrow at 7:30. Second round of the boys' high school soccer playoffs coming up next. Here we go. Second round of the boys' soccer playoffs tonight. Alma Heights taking on Harlandale at Harlandale Memorial Stadium. Mules down 1 0 early in the second half. Clayton Holmes taking a free kick. He bends it just over the outstretched hand of the goaltender. Great strike makes it 1 all. Then 11 minutes left in regulation. Heights gets a penalty kick for a handball. And Gavin Wiltshire converts the eventual game winner. Mules win it. A hard fought battle 2 1. Advance to the third round for the girls' side of it. Johnson is also moving on after their big win over Austin Lake Travis. And I think during the Spurs' story, call the Pelicans, the Saints. That would have been a great road trip. Three NBA teams and an NFL team. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Without Sean Payton. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. We're back in two minutes. It's been a pleasure having you with us tonight. Thank you. Indeed it has. We'll see you tomorrow. Good morning, San Antonio starts at 430. Have a wonderful night.